Anybody in this house ever been in a place in your life where you had some kind of friendship or you had a relationship with someone, and to be honest this morning, it was really, really draining. It was one of those relationships that when they called your phone, it was like that, that first, I don't want to get this. How many have ever had that? All right. This is what we're preaching on this month. Some of you have already seen the, the title of it. The series that we're doing is How to Hug a Vampire, all right? It's how to love people who suck the life out of you. That's what we're talking about this morning. We're going to be talking about it all this month. It's how to love people that drain you. Karen and I have had, she said it for years, they're life suckers. They just suck the life out of you. You get done and you're like, oh, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I can't take another phone call. That's what we're talking about this morning. So here's the first point, all right? We're going to go ahead and get this out of the way. I need everybody to be, get their smile on, all right? Everybody I need everybody in a good mood, okay? The first point to this message is, and I want you to look at your person next to you, all right? Number one, the first point of how to love a vampire is to realize that you suck, okay? Not, listen, before you get mad and say, a pastor's cussing, I'm not talking about, we're talking about that, that suck the life out of you. So look to the person next to you and say, I love you. Now be seated. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you this morning about loving people who suck the life out of you. Now, before we get to actually loving on those people, there's a few things that we got to address this morning that starts with us personally. It starts with us internally. It starts with you and it starts with me. If you look at Romans chapter 12 this morning, I want you to read with me this morning, Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Bow with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to share your word. God, I pray the next few moments you would have your way in our heart. God, I pray that everything that's said and done today would bring glory and honor to your name. Apply these words to our heart today. Invest in our life, God, exactly what we need. Let it be done in my life and let it be done in every life in this house. And everybody said, amen. Romans chapter 12, that puts it right back on us. I mentioned just a second ago, we've all had people in our life that they really just take a lot from us. We, we have to talk with them, and when you talk with them, they're usually in a bad mood. They're usually discouraged. They usually need something. Some of you have people, and, you, and I have people. The only time I hear from them is when they need something, amen? They need to borrow something, or they, they, need, to, they, they need you to help them move. They need you to do this. They, you don't, they don't ever call you just to rejoice and say, how are you doing? They call, and you say, you basically answer the phone and say, what do you need? Well, I need this. And you can go weeks without hearing from them, months. But you know when that phone rings, exactly what they want. They need something from me. Had heard from them. They must need money again. They must need a ride. They must need this. They need to borrow my tools again. They need to borrow my truck. I don't only hear from him when he needs to use my truck, when he needs to use something. We all have those people in our life. And it's gotten worse because now we have social media to everybody lets us know everything every single day of what's going on in your life. Some of you have people that when you get on social media, you get on Twitter, you get on Facebook, and you, you click on, and it's like, oh, I can't do this today, and you just get right back off. And, and we have access to everybody's life, amen? 
and it just drains us to the point where we're like, I can't do it anymore. It's drained me to the point there's some people that I just have to hide them. I just, I don't see what they post. How many of you have ever had to do that? It's okay, you can raise your hand, all right? Listen, hiding someone from Facebook is not a sin. All right, we're gonna get to that in just a second of why it's not a sin. There, there are certain things that it's okay to hide them, all right? I'm not telling you to delete them. There are cases where you probably do need just to delete and just move on with your life. Somebody say amen. Listen, but in order for us this morning to get to the point where we can love people that really just seems like everything that they do and all they're about is just about sucking the life out of us. When we think of a vampire, we don't think of somebody that we want to hang around with, right? When you think about a vampire, we think of something creepy, someone that only comes out at night, someone that can't be in the daylight. They can't look themselves in the mirror. Somebody say amen. It's just something about it that just, it's hidden. And, and everything that they do, it's like they're setting themselves up so that they can suck the life out of you. Every decision and every move that they have, every intention, they get close to you and they want to hang out. But you got to remember, they're a vampire. At the end of the day, they have one thing on their mind. They have one intention, and that is to drain you of your life. We have those people in our life. But the first thing we have to realize in that first point is, is that you and I have all been a vampire. Everybody shake your head like this, all right? You and I have all been the person and have been in a relationship, and we've been in a place where we were the ones sucking the life out of people when we were the ones in a place where it was all about us and what could I do to get what I need to move on. The first step in this and how to love people and how to love people that really just take things from you is realizing that we're, we're, we're that person. You know, a lot of times our frustration with people has a lot more to do with us than it does with them. I want to say that again to this side over here. A lot of our frustration that we have with people most of the time has more to do with us than it has to do with him. When you're in a bad spot and when you're not where you need to be and when you're not in your relationship with God, you're going to be frustrated. A lot of times we get frustrated with people and you know what? It's really not them that we're frustrated with. It's ourself. I want you to look at some scripture with me this morning. We find in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25, it starts with us. It starts with us in that human flesh. It starts with you and I in that needy personality that we have. Every single one of us in here, look at the person next to you and say, you're selfish. You're selfish. We're all selfish. Just we're born into that selfish nature that just to, to take care of number one. And so we find here, Romans chapter 7, the word puts it clear. So I find this law at work, although I don't want to do good, Evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Listen, church, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's easy to think, well, you know, Pastor, I started going to church. I, I gave my heart to Christ. Everything's good. You know, I don't struggle with that anymore. And I, I'm good. I, I, I gave all my sins away. I've been to church three weeks in a row. I've even read my Bible. I, I've started listening to Christian music and all this stuff. And listen, I'm not, all of that helps. All of that is great. But there's still a war going on in your soul. There's still a war going on right here in your mind. There's still that... Do you ever find yourself, or is it just me, that you can be praying, reading God's Word, and going to church and actually doing good, and then some random, crazy thought pops in your brain, and it could be, it, it could be bad, it could be evil, it could be uh, perverted. It's just like, have you ever just sat there and thought, where did that come from? Where did that, why would I think that? 
why would that even be in my brain? Why would that even come back? Listen, it's as simple as thoughts coming back from your past. Things that you did 15, 20, and 30 years ago that something happens, a song comes on, and immediately you're taken back to a time, maybe a place of sin in your life, and you think, I haven't thought about that in years. Uh, About a year ago, Kara and I were talking about just different things and the way we were raised and different situations, and something popped in her head, just a major thing that happened in her life, and she said, you know what? I haven't thought about that in 20 years. In fact, I forgot that that even happened to me. I forgot that that even took place. That is what we're reading about here in Romans. It's that I, I want to do good, but evil is right there with me. So then myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. It's that struggle between the righteous man and that sinful nature. We're always battling what to do. First thing we have to do is we got to get things right. We have been in that place where we've been that person that's just draining people. And we're just, I need this and I need you to do that. I want this and I want that. And, and that's not what I want. And we're just taking, 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 and we're not giving back. We've got to realize that Jesus died for you and me. And that whether we like it or not, we were born into sin. And we've all been sinners, and we all have to receive God's salvation this morning. Somebody say amen. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The great news is, is that Jesus has already paid the price for you and I. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 16 says this. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, This is Paul talking, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I have shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example of those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. See, Jesus is giving us an example where he's telling, listen, you're in a place where you need to be saved, but I saved you. And if you'll accept me, I can take away all those thoughts and all those things and give you a new life, and give you a purpose, and give you a reason to live. Jesus takes it a step further. Now, I know some of you are already offended because I told you that, you know, we all suck, and, that, that, and you took that very offensive. You're like, well, I, I, that's, I, I can't believe you would say that, Pastor. You don't know me, and that's not me. Well, let's just see what Jesus says about it. Let's just see how Jesus approached the fact when he was teaching what he told everybody. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus said it a different way. Jesus said, you're a hypocrite. Jesus said, you're a hypocrite if you think that everybody else has the problem and you don't. You're worried about the speck of dust in your brother's eye and you've got a big plank in your own eye. There used to be a good Christian band called Plank Eye back in the day. I don't know if there's any good Christian rock people around. Some of y'all, I got some people at Plank Eye. Elton knows what I'm talking about. Good, good Christian rock band back before, you know, it got all uh, secular and all that good stuff. But Jesus made it very, very clear. Listen, we all have a problem. We all struggle with that sinful nature to give me what I want, what I want. This is what I need. And so if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves loving people in a way that we're not helping. We're loving them because we need we want them to be like us, and we want them to do what we think they should do. And the whole time, how many of you know people don't like it when people tell you what to do? People don't like it when someone says, well, you know, here's what you need to do. You need to be doing this, 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 and this. And they're looking at you going, listen, man, I appreciate the instruction and all that, but I know way too much about your life. I, I follow you on Facebook and on Twitter. I, you, you, you just... It, you are the wrong person to be telling me. Listen, I went to high school with you. 
I'm married to your sister. Listen, I, I got all this. There's way too much I know about you for you to be looking to me saying, you need to live this way. Jesus first puts it back on us and say, listen, don't be a hypocrite. Don't catch yourself up in trying to judge and trying to determine whose life is right and whose life is not. You got to worry about yourself. You see, the first thing we have to do, Caleb, I'm glad you brought this and left this up here. Oh, man, I look good this morning. Amen. Exactly. You've got to put down the magnifying glass. Pick up a mirror. It's basically what Jesus is saying is quit trying to examine everybody's life to see exactly what needs to be fixed. If you want to start helping people and loving people through their problems, pick up a mirror. Examine yourself, search your heart. Say, God, what do I need to fix? How many of you ladies have the, 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 uh, the makeup mirror that's like magnified? It's got the light. I know that's kind of... I, I love playing with those in the mall at the, at the makeup counter until you get real close and like, eee, that's, <laughs> that's not good. You can see the poor. I mean, you see everything. It's like, ah, why would anybody want to do that? No wonder there, some women have so much makeup on. I mean, it's just like they look in that and they go, ah, they just keep trying to cover it up. You can't, that's way too much. You don't need to see that much of yourself, all right? But you know, there's something that has to take place What Jesus is saying here. Listen, if you're going to love people, if you're going to love hurting people, let's just agree, we're surrounded by hurting people. Why? Because we're hurting. We hurt and we get offended and we get wounded by things that take place in our job and people that we're friends with and people that we live with and we're married to. Things happen. You get, we get our feelings hurt and things happen that are not fair and people are mean. And so in order for us to love people who suck the life out of us, we've got to learn to love ourselves. And we got to accept God's love for us. And it starts with us looking in the mirror and confessing what we need to get right so that we can step out and start to help other people. Amen? So the first step this morning is this, and you guys are all going to get some of these when you leave. I got y'all some vampire teeth, all right? Everybody will get these when you leave. You're going to get your own set, all right? Just in case you, you, yours are worn out, I'm giving you some new ones, all right? You'll get these when you leave. But the first step is realizing, you know what? We've all been guilty of just taking and being needy, but Christ gave us an opportunity to get that right. And so when we accept him and we finally look in the mirror and say, you know what, God, I need you. Lord, I haven't done what, Lord, help me to be the person I need to be. Help me to put down the magnifying glass and stop looking for someone to blame. Stop looking for someone. Listen, some of you need to take the magnifying glass down and quit looking at Fox News and quit blaming your president, quit blaming your boss, quit blaming all those people. Pick up the mirror and say, all right, Lord, I'm, I'm frustrated with what, where my life is. I'm frustrated where our country's going, but I'm going to do my part to hit my knees and begin to pray and believe God. Let me tell you something. You criticizing your president is not helping anything, but you praying for your president might not change him, but it'll definitely change you. Oh, that was too good for y'all just not to even... Listen, if you will get on your knees and begin to pray for your country and for people that you disagree with, listen, you may not change them, but it's going to change you. And that's what Jesus is saying. Quit looking at all that stuff. Look in the mirror and change what you can change. I wish I had Michael Jackson's song. I'm looking on the man in the... Y'all know that song? Listen, that's what you have to do. You've got to look... You, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We want to look at somebody else. We've got to start with us. Second thing this morning is this, and this is where it's going to get good. Somebody say, thank the Lord. It's finally going to get good. Number two, the second thing you and I have to do after we realize that we have been vampires and realize that we got to surrender ourselves to God and have that humility to love people, we've got to love ourselves. The second thing you and I have to do is we've got to set up boundaries. You need to set boundaries in the way you love people. For too long in the church, and especially in church and especially in ministry, we think that unconditional love we can give, but that doesn't mean you give full access to your life. Boundaries are biblical. Everybody say that. Everybody say boundaries 
are biblical. There, are, there is biblical reasons and there is, there is truth in our word, in God's word, that you and I can love people, but you don't have to give people full access to your life. That is where social media has kind of come in, and sometimes we've all been guilty of that. We get on, and we, out of frustration or out of anger or out of excitement, we say things, and we put things out there, and we probably shouldn't. And once you put it out there, how many of you know that it's, it's, you're done, you're toast? I don't care if you delete it. People always took a screenshot of it, all right? It happens. Last year during hunting season, something happened to me that was all, I was, Kara went with me, and uh, we were hunting, and I had a typo on when we were hunting. One of my buddies texted me and said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're hunting. And he made the reference to, well, do you have Miss K with you? And I said, yes, I do have Miss K with you. And I, I typed in, I, was, I meant to tweet him back, I just shot her a mess of squirrels, all right? And I just, I just typed it in, and I hit send. Well, I should have checked my spelling before that took place because shot did not come out the way it needed to. And so before Kara's reading her, reading her tweet, and she just starts, Justin, oh my Lord, who I can't be. She starts crying, laughing so hard. I'm like, oh no. So I go on and delete it. I mean, it was on there for 30 seconds, maybe a minute. But guess, you know, my wonderful worship pastor, he had enough time to get it, take a screenshot of it before I could delete it. Kara's crying, and she can't even hardly she can't even hardly function. She is laughing so hard, and so that was a hard lesson I had to learn that you've got to you've got to watch what you say, and you've got to proofread because spell check is not your friend. Somebody say, man, it will it will bite you. It, it's not good. And so once you put it out there, and a lot of times we're so we just let full access. We put pictures and, and different things that we don't need to put out there. And it all only gives people access to our life. We're, we're so invested and we're, we don't need that much. There's boundaries that need to be established. There's something that you and I have to do when we're loving people, there has to be boundaries. Psalm 1-1 puts it like this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. There's something to that. There's something to putting boundaries up on who you talk to and who you hang out with and who you're around. There's got to be boundaries. Proverbs 4.23 puts it this way, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. See, church, there's, there's boundaries that you and I have to set up when we begin to love people, when we begin to invest in people. Listen, I, I get it. It's tough when you're in ministry and when you're trying to help someone and you're trying to invest in them and you want to see God move in their life. It's easy for us to kind of get so involved and we want them, we want to help them, but sometimes we give them way too much access to our own personal life. Sometimes we take too many phone calls and listen, there's got to be boundaries set up. There's got to be a boundary set up so that they don't completely rob you of everything that you have. When I was living in Oklahoma, we bought our first house, and there was property line there, and we were putting up a fence. And, you know, you, you call for a land survey. They come out and tell you where your boundaries are and all that stuff because you, you want to make sure you don't put a fence up over there and tear it down and all that stuff. So they came out. And they set the, all the flags and different things. Well, next door, there was, on, on one property line, there was a big tree right in the, I mean, right smack dab in the middle of our property line. And so they come out there, and the homeowner was like, all right, well, what do we, how do we fix this? Do, are we going to move? You can't, we can't move the fence two feet over, over there because the fence is going to be on his property line, and there's going to be two feet there, and we're trying to figure it out. So we ended up just going straight to the tree, and then jogged out around and just went, just made a little jog around the tree. And so the tree, basically we shared, all right? So all the limbs and all that stuff. But there was a property line that was established when they came out. They set up the boundaries of this is where your property stops and this is where their property begins. Listen, we have to do the same thing in our life in loving people. There's boundaries that have to be 
set up. You and I have to establish some boundaries when you're loving people. You cannot give them full access to your life, but you can still love them unconditionally. Somebody say amen. Look here in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. That's tough. When you start dealing with people and you start investing in people, there is boundaries that need to take place. There are things that are said and done that you have to set those boundaries up. Jesus set boundaries up in this way. Jesus told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. That is a boundary that he told. This is someone that was close to Peter. This is someone that was close to Jesus and knew everything that was going on, and yet he questioned what Jesus was doing, but Jesus wasn't willing to compromise what God had told him to do because someone was too close. And he said, he was basically telling Peter, listen, this is as far as you go. You can't go any further. There are boundaries to what I'm going to do and how I'm going to love people because at the end of the day, you guys know this, you can't help someone unless they truly want help. You can't help someone unless they truly want to change and they truly want to see God make the difference in their life. In order for you and I to truly do everything that we can to help people, we have to be willing to love them, but there are certain boundaries that you have to set up. You can counsel with people, but they don't need to be in your home every single day. You can have friends and you can have besties, but they don't need full access to you every single day. If they have more access than your husband does or your wife does, then there's a boundary issue. I'm getting real quiet. I know I'll get real quiet when I start talking about that. Listen, you've got to guard and set boundaries up in your marriage, in your relationships, friendships, everything that you have. They've got to establish this is as far as you go. You can't go any further. Listen, if I invite you to my house and y'all come over and you knock on the door and I say, come on in, you come on in, you are welcome into my home. You're welcome to come in the living room. You're welcome to use the hall bathroom. You're welcome to be in the kitchen. But just because I let you in my home doesn't mean you have full access to just walk in my bedroom and go on my bed and take a nap or you can just go through my closet. No, I invited you into my home, but there's, how many of you agree, there's some boundaries there. There's some, there's some kind of understood boundaries that when I come to your house, I just understand, well, you invited me into your home. You didn't give me permission just to, to go into your room and go through your drawers and go through your closets and, just, and just, just have full access. But so many times we do that when we love people and we're trying to help people in their walk with God. We just get little over, overachievers and we just say, here, you can do this and, and then you just call me anytime and text me anytime and I'm gonna love you and you can do this and you can, here's what I did. And we start giving them everything that God ever did for us. We start sharing every bad thing that happened in our relationship and we start giving them full access to everything and the whole time God's saying no 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 don't do that don't, don't th that's not needed you need to give them the truth and you can give them love but you don't have to give them full access to your life because what happens is they start draining you of everything that you have and you get to the point where honestly the phone rings and you look down and you see their number and you don't want to take the call. You don't want to talk to them anymore and you think, I don't, I don't have anything left to give. We have talked about this and talked about this and talked about this and talked about this. They just don't get it. And they just keep calling. Just, I can't do it anymore. I don't have anything left to give. This in order for us to love people who suck the life out of us, we first got to get things right with us. We first got to get forgiven, get our life on track. Second thing is we got to set some boundaries up on how we're going to minister and how we're going to love people and the access that we give them. Listen, you can love people from a distance and you can let Jesus hug them up close. You, you, you can love them 
as far as you can and you set that boundary, but you let Jesus be the one that makes the difference. You let Jesus get close and hug them and comfort them and do all of that. Jesus has a, Jesus is very good at that. Somebody say amen. There, he's very, God is very good about, about meeting people where they're at, but you and I've got to be careful that we don't put ourselves in a place and we don't overstep those boundaries and we don't put ourselves in someone else's life and more importantly, we don't allow certain people to get in our life. That's why I mentioned just a second ago, there are certain people you need to hide. There's certain people that you just need to hide. You don't need to see what they post. I don't need to see that they went to Walmart today and that they are on aisle four and now I'm on aisle six and, and look what's on sale and now I'm headed to the checkout counter and I just checked out. Now I'm walking my buggy to the car. Bless God, I got a good parking spot. Oh, looks like a beautiful day. Feeling blessed, feeling happy, feeling annoyed. I mean, it's just, you, you get all this stuff and every time you, you just begin to read their post and you're thinking, Ah, I just want to punch them in the face. I don't, I don't ever want to see them again. And you get to church and you're like, I, you, listen, and it's the other way too. They're posting everything. You know when they're mad at their husband. You know when they're broke. You know when they're excited. You know all this stuff. And it's like, I don't need to know that. You know why? Because you haven't set up the boundaries. You have to set those boundaries up for you. You have to set those boundaries up so that you can continue to minister and love people the way God wants you to love them. You're not Superman. You and I are not God. We don't have the ability to give all and give everything and meet every need and yet still stay excited and full of God's love. We can't do it. We'll close with this. Scriptures put it this way. Galatians chapter 6 it says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves. Catch this. Watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks there is something they are not, they deceive themselves. That's what we talked about in the first point. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Verse 5, for each one should carry their own load. Listen, you and I can't help somebody if they don't want help. But there's a process that takes place that you cannot do everything. You can love people, but you can't fix people. And there's that, listen, I'm not saying don't help people. Y'all understand my heart this morning. I'm not saying don't invest in people and don't love people. But there's that sense when we get saved and we love people in church that we want to truly help them. And we want them to experience exactly what God did for us in our life. Amen? We want them to experience that freedom and that joy that comes with being obedient. We want them to see God move on their life. We want them to experience the revival in their family and the revival in their spirit. That what we have experienced, that freedom to worship, that freedom to love, that freedom to, to finally accept yourself for who you are and know who you are in Christ. We want them to, we want them to have that. We see them broken, we see them bound, and we see them discouraged, and we just want to, we want to fix it. We want to fix it, and we think if I spend enough time with them, and if I do this, then that'll fix it. But we can't do that. You can't carry their burdens and yours. I heard a quote by football coach Lou Holtz, and he said, it's not the load that breaks you down, it's how you carry it. It's not the load that breaks you down. It's how you carry it. You and I, the third thing we have to do, listen, we've got to stay full of God's presence. You've got to stay full of the things of God if you're going to be able not only just to carry what you've got going on in your life, but if you're going to be able to, to minister and love people that are struggling. But you have to be willing to carry your own load, and you've got to be full of God's presence and humility, knowing, God, I need you. There's something that growing up, my mom is still this way. And many of you, y'all might have a mama like this. My mom's purse is a uh, survival kit. Uh, it's, it's huge. It's big and it, there's like 82 compartments. And it's 
almost reminds me of, of Mary Poppins. I mean, we've seen Mary Poppins, like her bag. She just pulls stuff out of there, you know, cars and houses and stuff like that. She just reaches in. It's like this bottomless pit, and she's like looking around. My mom, all growing up, no matter what, no matter where we went, my mom was always prepared with things. She always, there's a pen and a piece of paper in there. There's, there's crackers. There's always crackers. She has certs. I don't know if y'all, but I grew up on certs. We have the different colors and stuff like that. I actually had a cert yesterday. I've got them in my hunting bag. I've got a little roll of certs that I keep there. But she, she always has certs. She's always got a little package of gum, and it's, it's usually juicy fruit. Or Big Red, I mean, she's still old school. Even today, it's not the new modern. It's not Orbit or, or whatever, the Denti Ice, none of that stuff. She's got the old school juicy fruit. You know, it's after two minutes, you're like, you can't eat it anymore. So, and, and, and there's always two. There's always, on that gum, she cuts, she peels it in half because for a whole piece is too much. How many ladies that way? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. She, there's half pieces of juicy fruit. No, I, my whole life, I've grown up, Mom, if, if I was hungry, if I needed something, mom had, you could find some certs, a little half piece of gum. There's crackers in there, uh, Star Crunch, oatmeal pies, little, little oatmeal cream pies, always some of those in there. And they might be smushed a little bit. That's right. When you're hungry, you can just, you just lick it. You smash it all together. You can't hold it out, but you just got to get the wrapper and you got to lick it down like that. So there, there's, there, there's always something there. She's, she's got clippers. She, she's got, how many of you have a mom that way, or how many of you that way? Some of you, maybe some people here this morning, you're just that purse. I mean, it's just a survival kit. If we got dropped off in the jungles of Africa, we, I'd be good for six months. Mom would have, she'd have fishing line, and there's thread in there. We, we've got all kinds of stuff. We can make it. She, she's prepared. And I don't know how many times we've been different places and be hungry, and I'm starving, I need something. Here, here, eat a cracker, eat this, eat something. And my mom is one of those people that, and my grandma was this way, her mom, when you would get to the house, no matter what time of day it is, don't, it doesn't matter if you just got through eating, here, let's eat something, are you hungry? And you sit down, and they just start placing stuff in front of you. No, grandma, I don't, I don't, I don't want anything to eat, I'm fine, we just ate, and she's just slowly putting little, little leftover roast and potatoes, and, and, and there's some corn, and then you've got little things, and she just keeps setting it in front of you, and the whole time you're saying, Grandma, I'm fine. We just ate. I'm good. I don't need anything. And then she puts a glass of tea down and Dr. Pepper there. And she's just throwing stuff. And before you know it, guess what happens? You start eating. You're just eating. And then she says, I've got some cobbler. And she'll have cobbler. And then she breaks out the bluebell ice cream. And, you know, there's always room for ice cream, right? So you just, it just starts to, it just keeps going. And it's, it's like, what is going on here? And, and if I'm around my mom, it's the same way. We eat on stop there's brownies and cookies and there's pig picking cake and then there's there's leftover there's just stuff everywhere there's just food and we eat and then we get done eating and then we're two hours later let's eat again there's something in it's just like constant you see in order for us to meet the need of people in order for us to love people that suck the life out of us in order for us to love people who drain us of our joy, that drain us of our, you know, of, of any confidence that we have, that the, in order to love people like that, you and I have to be full of God's presence. Because see, what happens is, and I, I mentioned this before, we started in the first point, a lot of our frustration with other people has more to do with us than it does with them. Because we're expecting them to give us something that they can't give us. We have to be prepared, and you've got to be willing to feed yourself. You've got to be willing to prepare. You've got to take, listen, if you have to, take some crackers with you in your purse. I have in my truck right now, in my console, I have little Debbie snacks, and I have beef jerky, and I have all this other stuff. You know why? Because I have three boys that are starving. They're starving. They never have enough to eat. Never. They, we, go to, we go hunting, and they've got cookies and crackers and beef jerky. They've got all this stuff. They're starving. Dad, I need something to eat. Dad, I need something. You see, they're at a place right now where I, they need me to feed them. They're relying on mom and dad to have to 
because they're not thinking ahead saying, okay, we need to go, I need to eat. I realized growing up that my mom prepared me over and over that she, through her being prepared, it taught me to be prepared. Listen, in order for me to love people, in order for me to, to invest in people, I've got to eat myself. I've got to do what I need to do to make sure that I'm full. I can't depend on you to bring something for me to eat. Has that ever happened to you when you're getting home and I, we live out in the country, so there's a lot of times we're just having to get food and there's that miscommunication that I thought you already ate, I didn't get you anything to eat. In that moment, they walk in, everybody's got a hamburger but you. Listen, I, don't feel bad for me because you can tell I hadn't missed too many hamburgers, all right? But that moment where the, they didn't get you anything to eat, it's like, you didn't give me it. Jill do that to you all the time? All the time. I didn't get anything to eat. Who, what am I going to eat? You see, investing in people, you have to be the one to prepare. Be full of God's grace and His mercy and His love. You've got to spend time with God and spend time on your knees praying and seeking God for what He wants you to have. You see, frustration is this. Frustration is that gap between what we expect and what we experience. It's, it's the gap in between what we expect from people and what we truly experience. It's that in between, well, I thought it was going to be this way. But in all reality, this is what's taking place. So there's some frustration there. Well, it's not really what I wanted. It's not really what I signed up for. It's really not. I was expecting God to do something different. I was really expecting them to, to move forward. I was really expecting them to get it. Listen, there's nobody in this room that has that frustration on a weekly basis more than me. When I invest in people and I love people and I expect to get the phone call, then when they finally say, Pastor, I'm going to do this, and I just want to say, ah, you're killing me. You're killing me, Smalls. You, you just, you don't get it. When are you going to, I need you to be here. But all I'm getting is in this, that frustration. If you're trying to make, you're trying to help somebody, and trying to fix somebody, sometimes they don't want the help. And what happens is it begins to drain you of everything that you have. And if you're not praying, if you're not seeking God, and you're not reading God's word, and you're not feeding yourself, guess what? You're going to be starving. Starving. You're going to be hungry because you're going to want them to give you something. They don't have anything to give. Not only do they not have anything to give, they don't even know how to cook. They don't even have any groceries to cook with. They don't have any ingredients to read it. Get close to giving you what you need. That's why as a Christian, as a believer, you've got to feed yourself. You've got to prepare yourself to invest in people. That takes you and I realizing that we've got to get things right with God. Number two, we've got to set some boundaries up. We've got to set some boundaries up the way we love and the way we let people invest in our life and how close we let them get. They don't need to know every single thing about you. Guess what? You don't need to know everything about them. Been in way too meetings, too many meetings, and people say, Pastor, we're just gonna get together. The word says just to share with one another all your faults, and blah, blah, blah. be careful with that. That's not what that's talking about. There is a place and time for that, but it's not everybody get together and tell their deep dark secret and drag out all the skeletons in the closet. Because everybody's cool until it crosses the line in the sin. Everybody's good as long as it's just still in a pack of bubble gum and, you know, do all that. But then when we get into some other issues, it's like, whoa, whoa. I didn't know that about you. Because here's the deal. You can't forgive people like Jesus forgives people. And more importantly, you can't forget like he can forget. There's got to be boundaries the way you love people. There's got to be boundaries that you set up so that you can continue to invest in people's lives and you can love people for who they are and you can love them knowing that God's going to make the difference and you don't walk around completely drained all the time so that you don't dread picking up that phone call, so you don't dread answering that email, so you can truly love people because you've set the boundaries up. And more importantly, 
you have prepared yourself to love people. You have prepared yourself in prayer and reading God's word. You've prepared yourself in coming to church and being in ministry and investing in people. You've prepared yourself. You're not starving. Because if you go to invest in people and you're needing them to feed you, guess what? You're going to be in trouble. They don't have anything for you to eat. Carolyn Harris may not be there with you with her survival purse to give you some crackers and an oatmeal pie. May not be there. So you got to prepare yourself in your daily walk with God. It starts with that right here. Say vampires can't look themselves in the mirror. There's some people that have a hard time looking in the mirror, damning their own life because they're not living right. Jesus says it starts right here. It starts with me looking at my own reflection, examining my life and getting things right so that I can truly love people that need to be loved. More importantly, <laughs> more importantly, so I can love people like me. So I can love people the way somebody loved me. Every single person in this room is here today because somebody loved you. They're willing to look past your faults and your past, all of it. They're willing to cry with you. They're willing to pray with you. They're willing to invest in your life and love you. And they were willing to do that because they had prepared themselves. They weren't worried about examining you or judging you or trying to fix you. Way too long, church has been about, hey, let's, let's fix this person. Get in here and we'll fix you. We'll tell you what you need to do. You need to do this, say this, do this, repeat that four times, be here for six weeks in a row, and blah, 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 and do that, then everything's going to be fixed. Nobody wants to deal with that. But if you can love people, you can love people with boundaries and you can love people, invest in them knowing that you got up and said, God, examine my heart. Prepare my heart so that I can love somebody unconditionally. So I can truly see their need and not my need. If we were honest this morning, we'd all admit that it's hard to pick up the mirror and say, I need to fix this. I need to fix that. I struggle with this. I struggle with that. The reason why we stay frustrated with a lot of people is because we have that sin in our, life, our own life and we're trying to, we're pointing it out in their life. There, 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 there. It's a plank eye. Walking around with a big plank in our eye trying to pick out a little thing in somebody else's life. Jesus saying, listen, why don't you just worry about yourself? Get this fixed right. And if you'll fix this, and if we all will fix this, we'll have a church that can love people we can take, we can love whoever walks through the doors. Because we love ourselves the way God loves us. Because we've examined and said, you know what? It's like Paul said, I'm the worst, I'm the chief of sinners. There's nobody worse than me. I've done it all, but yet he forgave me and yet he saved me. He continued to do what God called him to do. Listen, it's no fun. <laughs> It's no fun trying to love people that honestly you know their intent is just want, take, 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 take. But you'll never be able to do it if you don't get things right with, you, with God yourself. If you don't get to the point where you say, you know what? Search my heart. Give me what I need so that I can invest and love people the way they need to be loved so I won't stay in a constant state of frustration. I don't be frustrated with my walk with God. I want to truly be able to love people through their problems. Not have to examine them, not try to tell them what to do, but I truly want to be able to love them the way Christ loved me. How many of you want to do that? Listen, it's tough loving people that just drain you of everything, but it can be done. You set the boundaries up and you put God first. God will give you a ministry and God will give you the ability to love people and love people through their situation. So that it doesn't just always be about us. It can truly be about them. Stand with me this morning. We 
got to get to the place in our life where we can believe the most in people but need the least from them. That's what God wants us to be able to do, to be able to love people and believe for the greatest things in their life but yet not really need anything from them. But to truly just love them, push them towards the cross and push them towards the things of God so that they can experience what you experienced. In order to do that, it takes us taking some self-examination and getting some things right. It's tough. Listen, I realize this morning this wasn't a shouting message. This wasn't something we're going to jump up and down about because it deals a lot with us. Loving people and staying frustrated with people and what's going on and what's not going on. Listen, it starts with us. It starts with our walk with God. If we get that right, our attitude changes everything. Our attitude, we begin to see things different. Listen, I'm talking from experience. In order to love people that suck the life out of you, you got to be willing to set some boundaries up. you got to be willing to give some things to God and say, you know what, God? i got my own issues. <laughs> I've got my own problems that I'm still struggling with. Help me deal with my issues. And in that process, God will help you to minister to other people so they can experience the same thing you want to experience. Amen? Bow your heads with me this morning. Hallelujah. I want to ask you this morning if you're here and you just say, Pastor, I, I've been guilty of, of just being that person that just, I just take, 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 and I just, I don't want to be that person. I want to know today that God's in control of my life and that I'm in a place where God can use me. I don't want to take from people. I want to get to a place where I can give your love that you've placed inside of me. But you know this morning just sitting here during this service, you know that you've been guilty of just <laughs> been guilty of just sucking the life out of somebody. You just don't know if you can, you don't want, you want that to stop. You want God to put in his love so that you can truly help people, so you can truly love people the way you want to be loved. If that's you this morning, we just slip your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All over this room this morning. Hallelujah. How many of you would be honest this morning and just say, you know what, Pastor, I've, <laughs> I've been guilty of just not feeding myself. I've, I've been guilty of just expecting other people to give me what I need. And it's put me in a bad spot. I, I realize today that I need to be the one feeding myself. I need to be the one preparing myself for ministry and not having to depend on somebody else to do it for me. You know this morning you need to do a better job at that. You need to do a better job of praying, reading God's word, and investing in that relationship so that you can truly be what God wants you to be. If that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up? Thank you. My hand's up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I love you this morning. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I'm asking you today, God, in each and every life, every single one of us, God. Lord, it's your desire that we would love people the way you loved us. But too many times, God, we, we go about it the wrong way. We're too busy focused on them and not us. I ask you today, Lord, in every single life and each and every single one of us, God, that we would put down the magnifying glass pick up a mirror and begin to examine our own life, begin to examine our own motives, our own attitudes, our own spirit, so that we can truly help those in need. We can truly minister to those that are hurting. But God, we, it won't drain us. It won't drain us of all of our spiritual nutrition, God. It'll just, we'll be prepared, God, and we'll know that through our prayer time and through our walk with you and through our reading of your word, God, that it has put us where we need to be, God. So we're not dependent on somebody else to give us what only you can give us. God, help us today in this room. Every single one of us, God, I pray that you would help us to invest in other people's life, God, to help us love people, God, that seem to just drain us of all of our energy. Prepare us, God, personally. Search our heart. Help us get things right. Help us get full of your presence, God. Help us to truly be spirit-led in everything that we do so that we can truly be your hands and feet in this lost world. God, let it be done in my life and let it be done in every person in this room today. If you agree with that this morning, say amen.